O Almighty God, you pour out on all who desire it the spirit of grace and of supplication. Deliver us when we draw near to you from coldness of heart and wanderings of mind, that with steadfast thoughts and kindled affections, we may worship you in spirit and in truth through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Glory to God in the highest. And, and peace to his people, people on earth. Lord, Lord God, heavenly King, King, Almighty God, God and Father, we worship you, you. We, we give you thanks, we praise you for your, your glory. Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, Christ only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we are to pray, and to give more than we either deserve or desire. Pour upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask except through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated to receive the word of God. A reading from the book of Job. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was pure and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. A day came when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also arrived among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, Where do you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roving about on the earth, and from walking back and forth across it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on the earth, a pure and upright man, one who fears God and turns away from evil, and he still holds firmly to his integrity. 
so that you stirred me up to destroy him without reason. But Satan answered the Lord, Skin for skin, indeed, a man will give up all that he has to save his life. But extend your hand, and strike his bone and his flesh, and he will no doubt curse you to your face. So the Lord said to Satan, All right, he is in your power. Only preserve his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord, and he afflicted Job with a malignant cant ulcer from the sole of his feet to the top of his head. Job took a shard of broken pottery to scrape himself with while he was sitting among the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Are you still holding firmly to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he replied, You're talking like one of the godless women would do. Should we receive what is good from God and not also receive what is evil? And all this day, Job did not sin by what he said. The word of the Lord. We will pray the psalm responsibly by whole verse. Give judgment for me, O Lord. For I have lived with integrity. <clears throat> I have trusted in the Lord and have not faltered. Touch me, O Lord, and try me. Examine my heart and my mind. Fear love is before my eyes. I have walked faithfully with you. I have not snatched up with the worthless, nor do I consort with the deceitful. I have hated the company of evildoers. I will not sit down with the wicked. I will wash my hands in the sins, O Lord, that I may go in procession around your altar. Singing aloud a song of thanksgiving and recounting all your wonderful deeds. Lord, I love houses that you dwell and the place where your glory is. Do not sweep me away with sinners, nor my life with those who thirst for blood. Whose hands are full of evil plots, and their right hand full of rise. As for me, I will live with integrity. Redeem me, O Lord, and have pity on me. My foot stands on a real ground, in the full assembly of my voice last a reading from the letter to the Hebrews. After God spoke long ago in various portions and in various ways to our ancestors through the prophets, in these last days he has spoken to us in a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he created the world. The sun is the radiance of his glory and the representation of his essence, and he sustains all things by his powerful word. And so, when he had accomplished cleansing for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Thus, he became so far better than the angels as he has inherited a name superior to theirs. For God did not put the world to come about which he was speaking, are speaking, which we are speaking, under the control of angels. Instead, someone testified somewhere, What is man that you think of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him lower than the angels for a little while. 
You crowned him with glory and honor. You put all things under his control. For when God put all things under his control, he left nothing outside of his control. At present, we do not yet see all things under his control, but we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that, by God's grace, he would experience death on behalf of everyone. For it was fitting for God, for whom and through whom all things exist, and bringing many sons to glory, to make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For indeed, he was who makes holy, and those being made holy, all had the same origin. And so he is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. The word of the Lord. of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Mark. Glory, Glory to you, Lord Christ. Some Pharisees came, and to test Jesus, they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, He wrote this commandment for you because of your hard hearts. But from the beginning of creation, he made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, and the two will become one flesh. Therefore, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. In the house once again, the disciples asked him about this. So he told them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Now, people are bringing little children to him for him to touch. But the disciples scolded those who brought them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little ones come to me, and do not try to stop them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth. Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. After he took the children in his arms, he placed his hand on them and blessed them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord the word that keeps cropping up in the readings this morning is the word integrity. It's related to our word integer. It means something that is whole, something that is one, something that isn't divided into different parts or different, different fractions of itself. It means being a whole thing, a whole person, a whole number, not two. And this is an important concept because we're very often tempted to go off into two and even more directions in our life. Situations crop up and we need to decide 
Which way to go? What am I going to do? What am I going to choose? And the temptation is there to try to choose more than one thing, to try to have it all, to try to have both our cake and eat it too. But we can't do that any more than I can walk in two different directions at once. Where my feet go, the rest of my body will go. There's no division that's possible, really. And so there's a, there's a, a long-standing tradition of the clergy being faced with people who come with questions, what should I do, Father? And it usually takes the form of, Father, is it a sin if I do A, B, or C? Or do I have to do X, Y, or Z? And that's an important question because we, we want to choose the right thing. We know that there is a right or wrong, we just don't know which is which. And that was important in Jesus' day as it is still in our own. And those questions crop up precisely when we are confronted with changes that we didn't ask for. When things come upon us that, that we didn't expect, that we're not prepared for, that we haven't considered before that maybe have never happened before. Maybe no one has any experience with them before. And we have to make a choice. We have to decide what to do. Sitting still may be one of the choices, but it's still, that's a choice. In Jesus' day, change had come upon the people of Judah. Yet another in a series of foreign overlords had invaded their space and had started making demands. And the people don't know which way to go. Some people want to go the way of forceful, active rebellion. Some people want to go the path of eager collaboration in the hope of getting the best possible deal. Some people believe in grudging compliance, generously seasoned with passive resistance and non-cooperation whenever possible. Some are seeking optimistic compromises. Some people just want to ignore it and hope it'll go away. But most just want to have an untroubled life, and they can't, not under those circumstances. And so they seethe and they grumble and they sink into depression and lethargy and joyless routine. Some figure it doesn't matter which, what, which you choose, as long as it releases some of that inner tension. But into this landscape comes Jesus of Nazareth, announcing that the kingdom of God is at hand. And this is good news for some. They've been waiting for a long time, a couple of hundred years, for God to send his anointed one, his Messiah, his Christ, to fulfill the promise of a land flowing with milk and honey. And maybe Jesus is the one. Maybe he is that Messiah, that anointed one of God. Maybe he's going to be the one to do that. After all, he's done some good stuff. Ah, say others. Yeah, but he's teaching a very different and a far more challenging version of what it means to be a Jew than many of the largest and most influential factions in Israel have come to think. And those influential factions have a lot going for them. Even in the troubled days of Roman occupation, they enjoy being influential. People look up to them. They're used to having things their way. Judaism works for them because they can keep up with its demands, and they can keep up with its demands because they help to define what those demands are. But now comes Jesus, and he's offering them a different version. And this doesn't sit well. And so they decide to test him. They decide to trip him up. They decide to confront him with a hot-button issue under Mosaic law. And if he agrees with their interpretation of the law, well, then he's one of them, in which case life goes on as it always has. And if not, he's alienated an important base of support. And if he keeps giving disagreeable answers, eventually he'll be out of the way soon enough, in which case life goes on for us just as it always has. This is a win-win, the Pharisees are saying to themselves. And so they pick a hot-button issue. They pick the issue of divorce a contested issue, one about which the rabbis argue what is allowed and what is not. 
What the Pharisees miss, though, is the fact that it doesn't work this way. They, they want to know how to behave, but they look to the law for guidance. They want to know what to do, but what to do is not all there is to the story. Jesus forces them to admit that there's something far deeper at stake here. The kind of answer he gives is very different from the one that we give today. Nowadays, we expect our religious leaders to say, well, what does your heart tell you? Jesus doesn't say, well, as long as you're at peace with your decision, whatever you decided must be okay. Jesus doesn't say, well, as long as it makes you happy and nobody gets hurt, do what you want. He doesn't say, as long as you support your your, your, your ex and, your, and the children, no problem. Jesus doesn't simply pit one legal finding against another. His answer is not whatever Moses said, do that. Instead of looking at, at external behavioral law and instead of looking at internal feelings and thoughts, Jesus points to something different altogether. Jesus points to the personality of God. And what is the personality of God? God doesn't go back on his word. God doesn't make promises and then decide that it's too hard or too painful or too much trouble to keep them. God will, in fact, die a painful and humiliating death rather than stop loving and ungrateful and unfaithful people. This is the personality of God. And this is the personality that we are called to share in. This is the personality that we were given to inherit. We were created in the image and likeness of God and we lost that image and we lost that ability to have the personality of God, but it is being offered back to us in Jesus Christ. We were not created to go back on our word, and Jesus Christ offers us the opportunity to live back into that again. That's why Jesus says at the end of his Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew's Gospel, he says, let your yes be yes and your no be no, because further qualifications will only lead you down the path of evil. Anything else comes from the evil one. Say yes or no. If you say yes, say yes, not yes, but I have reservations, but I have qualifications, but I have terms and conditions that must be met. Say yes, not yes, but as long as I don't have to go in 100%. Say yes, but not yes until something better comes along. See, as soon as we start looking for qualifications, as soon as we start watering down that yes, we become easy prey for the evil one. He's going to start messing not only with our reasoning and our mind, but with our hearts and our feelings and our sentiments and our fears and our hopes. Satan's going to dangle our fondest dreams and our worst nightmares before us, just as he did before our friend Job. And we can rationalize just about any compromise to get what we want or to avoid what we fear. And it takes deep faith, like that incredible, almost impossible to fathom faith of Job's, not to just curse God and have done with it, because death is preferable to what I'm going through right now. But instead of looking at the law to tell us how to behave, instead of looking at our feelings to tell us that they should be our guide to what is right and wrong, Jesus says the answer lies in relationship with a God who has that kind of personality, the personality that once he has said yes, never takes it back. That personality that we were called and given the privilege of sharing. Jesus says, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Well, what has God joined together? Well, 
the marriage thing. Yeah, that's that's in there. That's true. Christians who make their vows in in marriage do not make their vows to one another. Those are vows made to God about what they will do for one another. The sacrament of holy matrimony is a sacrament, a life of promises kept, even if they're not reciprocated. It is not a sacrament, a sacrament of aspirations abandoned. But that's a small part of it. What else has God joined together? The whole Song of Psalms is an extended meditation on the marriage between God and his chosen people. John the Baptist talks of himself as the bridegroom's best man. And who is this bridegroom? And who is the bride? Who is this bride that Jesus loves with a permanent, irrevocable love despite all that is done to him? Just the way the prophet Hosea was called to live his love to his unfaithful wife. Jesus loves until he is parted from us by death. And because of that love, it is revealed that not even death is strong enough to overcome love. That it is stronger even than the gates of hell. And this is why Jesus says that everything, even what seems unjust because it seems so hard and painful and impossible, everything is possible with God. That's why St. Paul can turn around and write, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. By giving up yourself for someone else. By setting aside what you are entitled to for the sake of someone else. The whole governing metaphor of the book of Revelation is the wedding banquet of the Lamb. Personality of God is that when God says yes, God means yes, and when God says forever, God means forever. That's the whole revelation to the human race that yes means yes, even when love goes unrequited, even when it is rejected. Instead of instead of enshrining that kind of love in a, a revocable contract, God offers instead a covenant our chance to say a permanent, irrevocable, unconditional yes to a God who has said a permanent, permanent, irrevocable, and unconditional yes to us. And in Jesus Christ, that union of God and humanity becomes complete and total and perfect. That is what we're grafted onto in baptism. That's what gives us access to the grace that enables us to say yes. And there is no other way to have life that is eternal except to reject a life that is temporary and conditional. There is no other way to have life that isn't lived under the menacing shadow of the death that comes with no. Who would want to try to force that apart? And it comes with all kinds of, all kinds of of reinforcements, all kinds of benefits. The institutional manifestations of, of Christianity are God's way of grooming us to live on that kind of a scale, to live on a scale that boggles the mind, to live out an eternal life of unimaginable goodness that plays itself out on the stage of a completely renewed creation. And all it takes is that we allow ourselves to be purged of our reservations, our qualifications, our buts, our unlesses, our untils, our if-onlys. All it takes is for us to be weaned away from our mutinies, our rebellions, our sit-down strikes, so that we can live fully in the reality that comes with a relationship with God. And we can enjoy the, get the blessings of that reality even now. Then we will know, without even having to ask, what to do. Then if we were to wonder, what would Jesus do? We will know because we will know the mind of Christ. We will have lived into the mind of Christ, who sets aside personal advantage and personal benefit for the sake of another. 
then we will live not by rules, not by convictions, not by principles, but by a relationship of loving and humble obedience, of yes to his Father. And along the way, yeah, there will be falls and stalls and detours and lost ways and abject failures. And sometimes the progress will be discouragingly slow and sometimes the effort and the pain will tempt us to despair and to give up entirely. But there are also merciful concessions to our weakness and our failures. I'm certainly grateful for them. And I'm not just grateful for them, I am reduced to speechless, awestruck humility that such concessions might be granted to me at all. I dare not presume that the concessions are now the rule. I can't say that what is mercy is now licensed to remain comfortably unrehabilitated. I can't assert that sin once forgiven is now sin approved and that I can now indulge in it with impunity. But God is not about giving us impossible demands that we cannot meet just to test us, but rather to show us that yes is possible and forever is possible. And if we will let ourselves live into that mind of Christ, then we will become not more like the world around us, but be transformed by, transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we do have something to go on that will let us test and determine what is the will of God, what is good and well-pleasing and perfect. Then we will lay aside who we have been and instead put on being the new person who has been recreated in God's image, in righteousness and holiness that comes from truth, in other words, from fidelity. Then, you and I will live, not ourselves, but Christ living in us. Then we will be one, whole, not disintegrated, not at war within ourselves, but one, complete, full, come what may. And then when the circumstances shift beneath our feet and the boundaries get redrawn and the ethical landscape falls apart, then when the social consensus around us about what is right and wrong morphs into something completely unrecognizable, when the boundaries between what is considered good and what is considered evil in society all of a sudden swap places, and we find ourselves no longer on the inside but on the outside because we are faithful to a different reality, then we, brothers and sisters, who are wearied by the changes and chances of this life, have the chance to rest in God's eternal changelessness, God's eternal, yes, God's forever to us. We drink it in, we share it, we become it, we live it, and we show it to the world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>
Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. That there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. And our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble, especially Lynn, Joey, Pat, Rolando, Jennifer, John, Danielle, Brian, Brandon, Tanya, Jay, refugees, and those affected by fires and extreme weather. And they may be delivered from their distress. Bless those who are rejoicing over milestones in their life, especially Isabel Curran, Juan Mariscal, Ed Wilder, Malika and Hayden Turner, Tom Kinnett, and Pam Jarwowski Thompson. Give to the departed eternal rest, especially Reginald O'Hara, Elizabeth Bowers, David Bolton, and Jane Hollenbeck. We give you thanks, O Lord, for all your many blessings, for the life of Dan Kelly, for the healings, blessings, and relief in response to our prayers, for our partners in prayer, worship, discipleship, and evangelism, and for our benefactors. Thanks be to God. We praise you for all your saints who have entered into joy, especially the ever-blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, St. Paul, St. Benedict, Blessed Daniel Nash, St. Francis of Assisi, Blessed William Tyndale, and Blessed Robert Grostesti. Let us now also pray in silence for our own needs and those of others. Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you for this, your Diocese of Albany. Inspire and sustain us in this time of transition. Incline our hearts to do your will, and so direct us in your ways that the leader you are raising up to be our bishop will find here joyful disciples making disciples, united in faith, unflagging in hope, and steeped in mutual charity. In your mercy, accept our repentance and grant us peace. Look with patience on our enthusiasms, Pour rich gifts and grace upon the Standing Committee, upon Bishop Smith, upon the Profile and Search Committee, and on all who are entrusted with the ongoing work of your Church, so that with diligence and charity we may discern correctly and walk righteously in your ways. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins 
against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you and talk, word, and deed by what we have done unto us and by what we have done unto them. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors and ourselves. We are truly sorry and we will repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you.
supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior, Christ, has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. O Lamb of God, who take away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy upon us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. The gifts of God for the people of God. And if you are joining us at home, I invite you to join us in the act of spiritual communion. I believe in you, Lord Jesus, present in the most holy sacrament of the altar. I love you above all things, and I long to receive you into my soul. Though I cannot now receive you in the sacrament, I pray you to come nonetheless into my heart. I embrace you, and I unite myself to you, for you are already within me, as I am in you. Let me never be separated from you. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace, and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please have a seat. Good morning. Thank you for coming and joining us in worship this morning. Just have a couple of announcements for you. Uh, today is October 3rd. Tomorrow is October 4th, which is the Feast of St. Francis of Assisi. And uh, uh, as is our tradition here, uh, we will bless animals. Today being the eve of his feast, we can, we can legitimately do that. So at 4 o'clock today, uh, we will be open for any, any furred, feathered, finned, uh, scaled, uh, exoskeletal uh, creatures who want to come for a blessing, I ask only that you bring with you a, a, a human who can get you here and take you back, and um, and that you uh, your human be duly masked while we're together. Uh, that'll be at 4 o'clock, and we'll try to do it out here. If it's raining, we'll gather under the colonnade, under the eaves at McNary, and do it there. Uh, finally, uh, this is the week in which we have pre-convention meetings for our diocesan convention. Our diocesan annual convention will be on the 23rd of this month, that's Saturday, the 23rd. Everything's virtual again this year. Um, and um, in preparation for that convention, we have pre-convention meetings this week, Monday and Wednesday evening at seven o'clock. Uh, those who are deputies and clergy have a special sort of voting access to that through a different application. Uh, but anyone can watch, uh, it'll be live streamed on Facebook and Zoom and you can you can see how the sausage is made and um, get an idea of what's on the agenda. There's also a link in the, um, there's links in the epistle and there's printed versions of the links anyway in the uh, announcement bulletin here so you can, you can tune in uh, and you can also download the convention book which has the agenda and all of the relevant items including a few resolutions that we'll be voting on this year. So. Um, that have been that are being brought to convention this year. So, at any rate, uh, take a look at that if you're if you'd like to see how the diocese operates and, and get a sense for that. And if you have any questions, uh, Dave Malsan is our deputy, and I am, of course, your clergy from the parish. The other thing you need to know is that because of the pre-convention meetings and because I have a role in them, uh, I'm going to be up at Christ the King Center um, tomorrow through Wednesday night, probably Thursday morning. I'll come back. And um, I'm still available, it's just that I need to be up there for the live stream because it's all done centrally from one place. So uh, I'll be up there for the live stream, but if you need me, you can reach me by phone, text, or email, and I will be up, um, able to respond as soon as, I'm, as soon as I'm free. And that, I think, is all the, all the news that's fit to print. So I would invite you now to stand for a blessing. May the God of mercy grant you blessings and peace all the days of your life. Amen. May he free you from fear, worry, and doubt, and strengthen your hearts in his love. Amen. May he grant you his gifts of faith, hope, and love, so that your life may be bountiful, and you may find fulfillment in his eternal kingdom. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.